Okay, so now we'll talk about 29.5, which considers the entirety of the universe and what it's made out of. Um, so when we talk about the Big Bang cooling and expanding, and we try to measure the curvature of the universe, um, whether it's flat or not, um, since we know that there's uh, an expansion going on, we know that there's a, uh, a force that's expanding the universe, and there's gravity that's contracting the universe. And when we try to balance out those two forces to require the Earth to be flat, not the Earth, the universe to be flat, the space between the stars to be flat, um, we end up with this picture that says, okay, 68% um, of the universe is in the form, the energy density is in the form of dark energy, and uh, another 30% of it or so is in the form of dark matter and ordinary matter with ordinary matter, which is everything you know about, um, which is ordinary matter like hydrogen, helium, stars, and other things. Less than 5% of the observable universe is made out of stuff that we can actually uh, study right now. And this is a big deal. Um, so uh, what we're saying here in this table is that 95% of the stuff in the universe is either dark matter or dark energy, neither of which have ever, ever been detected in a laboratory on Earth. That means this whole te textbook, everything we've talked about in this course, um, which has to do with objects emitting light, um, we've been ignoring 95% of the universe <laughs> while explaining that. We've been talking about now dark energy and dark matter, when we talk about the rotations and formations of galaxies, as well as the expansion of the universe, um, but uh, that's the, the main thing. So again, why do we think that? It's because the universe, the geometry of the universe appears to be roughly flat. Um, and so in order to have that, we need to balance out our forces of expansion and contraction. Um, so that gives us the constraints on the visible matter, dark matter, and dark energy. Now, we've long known that there was this uh, imbalance, and we assumed that most of the dark matter was um, ordinary dark matter. In other words, it was matter that was literally dark. We couldn't see it, and we started looking for it, and we realized that, hmm, it's actually not regular dark matter that is just not visible. It's some sort of other thing that we cannot detect, and um, we've also, uh, so you know, most of the energy density was believed to be that. Um, but then as the time went on and we realized the universe expansion was accelerating, we divided that exotic dark matter up into two parts, um, the exotic dark matter part and the dark energy part. So that's our current understanding of the universe today is the 70% uh, dark energy, 30% uh, dark matter and visible matter. So what is dark matter? We don't know. Um, the best guess so far are WIMPs, which are weakly interacting massive particles. So we need um, the amount of matter orbiting a galaxy. So if this is our galaxy, we need a... There needs to be a whole bunch of matter orbiting the galaxy in the halo um, in the form of what we call weakly interacting massive particles. They have to be massive. They have to be very heavy in order to cause the amount of gra gravity we measure, uh, but they have to also be, in physics speak, weakly interacting, which means they don't uh, leave a mark when they hit us, and that's the reason we can't see them. So um, there's neutrinos going through you right now, there's muons going through you right now, and they're not doing anything. So we call those types of particles weakly interacting. So WIMPs have to be even more weakly interacting than neutrinos and muons because even those uh, we can detect pretty easily, all things considered. Okay, so um, we uh, should be able to detect WIMPs eventually, and that's what we're looking for right now um, in most of our dark matter exper experiments. We look for um, them by their indirect interaction with matter. So they might hit... Um, a hydrogen molecule, uh, a water molecule, for example, and that would generate an electron which would shoot off a photon, and then we would measure the photon. Um, so that's, uh, that's what we're looking for. The reason we believe dark matter is a thing is not just the rotation curves of the galaxies where the stars at the edges are, are rotating too quickly. Um, we actually require dark matter for the formation of galaxies themselves. Um, we need the uh, uh, dark matter to coalesce into these halos first, and then 
um, the ordinary matter uh, would co coalesce around those dark matter halos. And if we don't have dark matter, um, we don't have the, the universe we see today in our uh, simulations of evolutionary, the evolution of the, the universe. So it's very, very interesting. So this is the universe in a nutshell. We've got our quantum fluctuations that lead to this intense energy density. And then the universe expands out from there in a period of what we call inflation. And then there's the afterglow of the Big Bang, the cosmic background radiation. And then the universe expands and cools, forms galaxies, stars, small dwarf galaxies at first. Then those galaxies collide with other galaxies and form the um, large spiral galaxies that we see today, where dark energy is now dominating the expansion of the universe. So this would be the Planck satellite, for example, that's looking back um, out, out, out into the light from the afterglow of the Big Bang. That's the radiation that it's seeing, and that's how we study the origin of the universe. Um, this 300,000, 380,000 years is the time period uh, after the electrons combine with protons. We call that era recombination because that's when electrons recombined with their atoms um, or combined in the first place. And that's the light of the afterglow of the Big Bang. Okay, so the inflationary universe, um, there are a couple problems with this picture of the universe as we know it today. Um, and both of them are solved uh, by the theory of inflation. So we are looking actively for evidence of inflation. We have not found any yet. Um, but without inflation, the Big Bang Theory uh, collapses. So we are putting all our eggs in the inflation basket because without it, we can't explain um, the Big Bang. So. The Big Bang is compelling for many reasons. The Hubble expansion, the cosmic background radiation, the, uh, the characteristic of galactic evolution um, throughout uh, time, the redshifts that we see, everything's consistent with a Big Bang uh, universe. The issue is there's a couple of things um, that uh, we call the horizon problem, um, which is, has to do with the uniformity of the universe. The cosmic background radiation is a very uniform temperature all across the, you know, you look up uh, on one side of the sky, you look to the other side of the sky, it's the same temperature in the cosmic background radiation, which means they had to be in contact long enough to reach the same temperature, okay? Um, but if we accept the standard Big Bang model, all parts of the universe were not in contact at any time. The fastest that information can go from one point to another is the speed of light. So uh, there's a maximum distance that light can travel as the universe expanded, began and expanded. That's the horizon distance, the furthest that two points can see. They can't be beyond that. Um, so we call this the horizon problem because um, they, they should have been beyond the horizon when the light was emitted. Um, so what's going on? Um, that's explained by this inflationary uh, theory, which is that the universe didn't expand very quickly initially, but then, so that allowed those eras to be in contact with each other, and then whoosh, then it expanded way out really fast, a period of rapid inflation as we call it, and then it continued to expand from there. So that solves the horizon problem because um, the uh, a period of very uh, uh, rapid um, uh, inflation uh, blew up the universe and allowed basically the early universe which would have been really close to each other and had all the same temperature it would have allowed it to spread that uniform temperature out across the sky and that would allow the cosmic background radiation to have roughly the same temperature and then even though they're beyond each other's horizon um, the temperatures that uh, before that would have been uh, allowed to equilibrate, so it's not um, a big deal anymore. So that's um, one of the problems that is solved by inflation is the horizon problem. The other is the flatness problem, and the flatness problem is uh, the, does it mention it here? Yes, the 
inflationary model that predicts that the universe would be flat. Um, and that's this curvature of space-time. So this is a really bad analogy, um, but the example is that if you inflate the universe fast enough, then, uh, you know, in at the local points, it looks very flat if you zoom way in on a, on a curved balloon. Um, so that's the idea, is that the universe expanded very quickly and smoothed everything out, and that would explain why the universe is flat. So it solves two problems with the Big Bang Theory, because the Big Bang Theory does not predict a uh, flat universe. It also does not predict the cosmic background radiation being as uniform as it is, but the inflation theory, um, which extends the Big Bang or just talks more about the early universe, solves both those problems. So you have to know those two problems, the horizon problem, horizon problem, and the flatness problem. And those are both solved by the theory of inflation. And why do you have to know that? Because the, this is the hottest topic in astronomy today, is uh, what's going on uh, in that area. Okay, grand unified theories here. Um, grand unified theories are gut theories, um, and they unify the fundamental forces of nature. Gravity, electromagnetism, the weak nuclear force, and the strong nuclear force. The strong nuclear force holds atoms together. The weak nucleo nuclear force uh, does radioactive decay. E&M basically does everything else, and then gravity um, is the, the largest force, uh, the longest range force of all the forces, um, and is uh, why we have planets and stars in the first place. So um, you have to understand that grand unified theories try to talk about these theories um, at the same time. Whereas like right now, if you do chemistry, you're not really, you don't care about gravity because gravity doesn't affect how quickly a chemical reaction happens. Or when you're trying to measure the force of a magnet, you don't really care about the strong force. Or when you're uh, trying to measure the uh, radioactive decay rate of a uranium atom, you don't care what the Earth's magnetic field is because those forces don't uh, affect each other at the current scales. They're frozen into separate areas so I only need to worry about gravity when I have a certain amount of mass. I only have to worry about the weak nuclear force when I'm dealing with radiation or radioactive decay. Electricity and magnetism only has to do with charged particles. And the strong nuclear force, I don't care about unless I'm doing something at the uh, proton or nuclear level. Um, but if you can imagine, the temperatures are hot enough that the protons in the nucleus of an atom are ripped apart into charged quarks and then I shine photons in there, suddenly now I have to ask, what are the photons going to do to the quarks? Um, so that means I'm looking at where these two forces are combined. And then the weak nuclear force, um, neutrinos would get in added in there. So now i got to consider what these three forces are doing. And if I get the energy high enough, at a high enough temperature, uh, theoretically gravity should play a role at those highest, highest temperatures. So we're trying to figure out then how these three, how these four universe uh, forces unify. And that's the cutting edge of, of physics. Um, if, when the forces are unified and we have a, th a grand unified theory, dark matter, dark energy, op uh, inflation, all those things come out naturally because they would be predicted um, by these uh, theories because if they are what they say they are, uh, it would have to be that way. Um, so, uh, this leads us to the anthropic principle. So uh, the universe seems to be highly tuned for us, for humans to live on the earth, and that's called the anthropic principle. Um, uh, so the Planck's constant, um, the coupling strengths of the fundamental particles, the forces and where they play uh, nicely at these temperatures and the time scales involved and all that stuff, Everything seems to be just right for us, not too big, not too small, all these rates and stuff. Um, you know, so the question is, all right, what's going on here? Um, so this anthropic principle is basically the way that their universe is, is because if it weren't, we wouldn't be here. So it, it, it's kind of like, I don't know, a chicken or the egg uh, type of thing um, where most physicists just say, like, whether it's tuned or not, it's impossible to say because if it were anything else we wouldn't be here at all so maybe 
life inevitably develops in a universe regardless of what the constants are, regardless of the speed of light, regardless of the strength of the strong force, regardless of other fundamental constants. Uh, maybe, uh, you know, I mean, it, if those constants were different, life would be different. So maybe we're here because we develop from those constants, but um, maybe there are other universes uh, making up something called the multiverse, where in each of those universes the constants are a little bit different, and um, you, you, there'll be completely different physical processes going on. And it's quite possible that all these fluctuations at the initial beginning of the universe set our universe out in this path, but then the constants were fluctuating and created a new, a different universe that expanded off in a different um, uh, reality, basically. So those types of things um, are, as they say here, bordering on philosophical and metaphysical because if you can't do an experiment and test it, then it can't affect you, and it doesn't really matter if it can't affect you. So um, it's fun to think about these things, and right now they're not really in the realm of science, but as soon as we can devise a test to access those areas, then suddenly they don't become, uh, they come from the come out of the philosophical and metaphysical realm into the um, realm of we can actually ask a question and get an answer. Okay, so um, we've come a long way and we've learned a lot, uh, but uh, we still have a lot of questions remaining. So, uh, anthropic principle, Big Bang, um, you got to make sure all these, you know, all these things. Um, and let me erase this. So, uh, in summary, for all these things, you should know that the universe is about 14 billion years old. Um, it's 13.8 billion years old since the Big Bang. Um, the universe, the model of it is that there was a quantum fluctuations which created a very high energy density. And from that point on, the universe has been expanding, cooling, and at this point, the expansion is accelerating. Um, the universe uh, began in what we call the Big Bang. It wasn't a Big Bang so much as it was a very high temperature, um, high density uh, universe a long time ago. We don't know what uh, it was doing before that point, but we can only know up to that point so far. Uh, the cosmic microwave background is the afterglow of the Big Bang. It was predicted uh, by the Big Bang theory. Um, it is consistent with a universe that is also 13.8 billion years old. It also helps us understand dark matter and dark energy. It predicts 70% dark matter, th uh, 70, uh, sorry, 70% dark energy, 30% dark matter um, and matter. Um, and all those things together create a universe made up of primarily wimps, and we're looking for those um, to figure out what uh, the nature of the wimp is. And once we get that, we will probably, uh, it will probably lead us to a grand unified theory. Um, and then the inflationary universe is a prediction that the Big Bang Theory um, requires initially after the very first quantum fluctuation that led to the uh, energy of the universe to be as high temperature as it was uh, to expand very quickly. And that allows the cosmic, background, cos cosmic microwave background to have the same temperature in all directions. That's a key thing that solves the horizon problem and the flatness problem. Um, and uh, the reason you need to know this, because this is a hot topic in uh, cosmology. And then the anthropic principle says that uh, the existence of humans depends on the properties of our universe. Everything seems to be just right for us to exist. The uh, answer to that is that, well, if it were any other way, we wouldn't be here. Maybe there might be something else. And to solve that problem, we speculate that there may be a multitude of universes or a multiverse um, where each one has different uh, fundamental constants and allows different uh, laws of physics to play out. Um, but that's uh, in the realm of uh, speculation at this point. But it's still fun to think about. Anyway, see you guys later.